Welcome to our bonus depreciation and QIP update with cost segregation tax planning webinar. Our speaker for today will be the principal from our New York office, Malik Javid. We like to begin all of our webinars with a little background on our company. KBKG is headquartered in Pasadena, California, with additional offices in Illinois, Georgia, New York, and Texas. Since 1999, we have successfully conducted thousands of studies nationwide. Our team has performed studies on facilities ranging in size from 10,000 to over 1 million square feet, resulting in the deferral of hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes. We also have highly qualified engineering and tax professionals on staff. Our engineering department has extensive construction experience in reading plans and utilizing RS means and Marshall and Swift cost estimation techniques. Our tax department provides support for all cost segregation tax related issues, including 1031 exchanges, AMT, passive activity, abandonment write offs, and lease provision. We are a preferred provider for thousands of CPAs across the country. Now I'll be introducing our speaker, Malik. Malik oversees engineering operations for cost segregation projects at KBKG. He is a certified member of the American Society of cost segregation professionals and is currently a member of ASCP, CSP Technical Standards Committee. Since joining KBKG in 2004, Malik has performed thousands of cost segregation studies, regularly, regularly reviewed architectural and engineering drawings, and construction cost budgets. He has provided continuing professional education to hundreds of CPAs across the country on various real estate tax issues. Malik has also successfully represented KDKG's clients in an IRS audit. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering and a Master's of Science in Engineering Management from the California State University, Northridge. With that, I'll turn it over to Malik to lead today's presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Malik Javed and I'm a partner at KDKG. And like uh, Jackie mentioned, I've been doing cost segs for now over 18 years. Um, today, our topic is bonus depreciation and, and qualified improvement property, which is really a hot button right now. Um, we are going to present and go over a lot of information about bonus depreciation. And most of our presentation is, is going to focus on the final and proposed bonus regulations that came out in September 2019 and August 2018. We will also go over the, uh, the TCJA laws and how regulations they change and clarify uh, this bonus regs and the 100% bonus depreciation. And additionally, we will talk about how CARES Act address the much anticipated retail glitch, which is the qualified improvement property uh, associated with 2017 TCJA. And then finally, I will spend some time discussing how bonus interacts with cost seg and how prior laws and how it may differ for property place and service those years. Okay, so before we, we dive into the specific changes of the CARES Act, um, I'm going to begin with a refresher of bonus depreciation and qualified improvement property to set the table. Um, I'll, I'll start with a little bit history about the bonus depreciation. Um, I remember Congress introduced bonus depreciation in 2002 through the Job Creation and Workers Assistant Act. I believe it was right after 9-11 in order to jumpstart the economy. So like I said, the purpose was to allow businesses to recover the cost of capital acquisitions more quickly in order to stimulate the economy. And then since then, since 2002, bonus depreciation has been extended multiple times. Um, and recently, TCJA, they introduced bonus and they started 100% on not only the constructed property, but also the used property. So, so a taxpayer that purchase or produce tangible property 
can now recover and depreciate the cost of property. And to be eligible for bonus depreciation, property must be of a specified type. So the original use of is must commence with the taxpayer or if used property must meet certain acquisition requirements. And there are two tests we will go over in our following slides. So what TCJA, uh, Tax Cuts Job Act, they expanded qualified property eligible for bonus to include not only new property, but used property as well. And this is a key thing that got changed in 2017. So new property generally means the original use of property begins with the taxpayer, whereas used properties, original use typically began with another taxpayer. So help me, uh, I'm gonna help you understand it more better that prior to TCJA 2017, anytime if it's a brand new property, if you acquire a brand new property, or if you construct a brand new property, it was eligible for bonus depreciation based on the percentage, uh, whether it was 50% or 100%. However, under this TCJA, they expanded the definition, which I believe is a great gift for real estate people, that now it can also be claimed on used property, regardless of whoever purchased or prior owner, who was it. As long as the building was put in service, uh, within the bonus eligibility window, the property will be eligible for bonus depreciation. So what is property of a specified type? Eligible property of a specified type, it includes maker's property with a recovery period of 20 years or less. Uh, it includes certain computer software, water utility property, it also includes a couple of new categories, uh, qualified film or television production and qualified live theater production property. And this new category was again introduced as part of TCJA. So what's very important to note is that several special asset classifications were removed after 2017. And those include qualified leasehold improvements, qualified restaurant property, and qualified retail property. I mean, these were special classifications that had favorable 15 year recovery periods and were bonus eligible in certain years prior to 2018. But they are all gone now and they have been replaced by qualified improvement property discussed, we're gonna discuss in more detail later. So prior to TCJA in 2017, taxpayer, they could generally claim 50% bonus depreciation. And there was an expected phase down of bonus to 40% and 30% for qualified property in 2018 and 19. And uh, these provisions, uh, they are defined under code section 168K-1, which are the old rules but the TCJA, they amended certain sections by striking the 50% language and inserting the applicable percentage. So for property acquired and placed in service after September 27, 17, just keep in mind, this date is very critical, September 27, 17, and before January 1, 2023, the, the bonus percentage is now 100%. So it allows taxpayer to immediately deduct the entire cost of qualified property as defined under this, that you can see section over there, 168K-2. So since the TCJA, the IRS, they issued proposed REX guidance in August of 2018, and then they, uh, they received comments and then they issued the final regs in September of 2019, which clarified the definition of written binding contracts, the used property, and situations where using ADS does not prevent bonus depreciation. So additional proposed regs were issued in September 2019, and then final, final regulations, they were issued in September of 2020. 
which clarified the bon uh, business floor plan financing. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of slides, and this is for the auto dealerships. And there is a good news, uh, especially for those ones who are the landlords, uh, not who are taking floor plan financing. And then they also clarify and make relaxation on the five year look back rule. Uh, the written binding contract, and last but not the least, component election, which is very and extremely important. So again, as mentioned, uh, property acquired and placing service after September 27, 17, and before January 1, 2023, is now eligible for 100% bonus. And it's then scheduled to reduce by 20% each year after that. And you can see it over here. So the bonus rates, they can be extended an additional one year for non-production period property and non-commercial aircraft. So what is a non-production period property? So in order to qualify for that, an asset must have a recovery period of at least 10 years be subject to Section 263 Cap A of the IRC and have an estimated production period extending one year and production cost extending $1 million. It must also have been acquired subject to a written binding contract entered into prior to January 1, 2028. So under prior law, as I mentioned before, a taxpayer was required to be the original user of qualified property. But now the, the taxpayers that acquire used property qualify if they meet certain requirements. What are the requirements? That number one, the property was not previously used by the taxpayer or a predecessor. The property was not acquired from a related party a component member of control group or in certain carryover basis transaction. And the taxpayer did not have a depreciable interest in the property before the acquisition. So these are very key three points. So the September 2019 final regs, they provided a clear definition of what is a, a predecessor as seen on this slide. So also the September 2019 final and proposed regulations, they reference special rules on fractional interest and also partnerships. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to go into here, but there are rules if a taxpayer, let's suppose, has a depreciable interest and then subsequently acquires more interest, or if they sell part of their interest and reacquire a different portion of the property. So basically, the the only uh, the new interest or part of new interest less their previous interest basis would qualify for bonus. But you have to read those rules very carefully. There are certain caveats. The September 2020 final regs they they talk about the series of related transaction and five year look back rule to determine if taxpayer had depreciable interest. So a property that was previously owned by a taxpayer and later purchased can qualify for bonus if they did not have a previous depreciable interest in the previous five years. So there is a relaxation in order to reduce administrative burden that you just look up just five years back. So the five calendar years uh, prior to current calendar year in which the property is placed in service and the portion of the current calendar year before the place in service date are considered to determine if the taxpayer had a depreciable interest in the property prior to acquisition. The five-year look-back period, it applies separately to the taxpayer. And furthermore, if the taxpayer, they have not been in existence during the entire look back period, that only the portion of the look back period during which the taxpayer have been in existence is considered. Component election 
uh, this is a very, very important topic. And the final regulations, they now make clear that the rules about the component election. So the taxpayer can make a special election to claim a 100% bonus rate on certain components acquired after September 27, 17. I mean, there is no longer a place and service required for using the component election. And the final regs, they also expanded the eligibility for large self-constructed property to include property that is manufactured or constructed under a written binding contract that does not meet the definition of a binding contract. So the final regulations, they clarify, they provide that the large self-constructed property must be maker's property with a recovery period of 20 years or qualified property eligible for bonus under the 2019 final regs without, without regard to acquisition date. Please keep in mind that there are certain types of property that are specifically excluded from bonus depreciation. In situations where the taxpayer is required, I will again emphasize required to use the ADS, bonus is not applicable. Example of this include property used outside the United States, tax exempt use property, and tax exempt bond finance property. Also excluded from bonus is property primarily used in certain regulated public utility trades or businesses. And this exclusion only applies to property acquired after September 27, 17, and place in service in tax year beginning on or after January 1, 2018. Section 754 step up elections, as long as there is a new partner coming in and the property hasn't been used by the taxpayer before, the step up can receive the new bonus depreciation. I believe the, 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 the section is 743B. That is what it is referring to. However, step ups due to deaths are specifically excluded from the new bonus depreciation where property is received from a descendant. Here are some other property excluded from bonus depreciation. Uh, it's property used in a trade or business that has had floor plan financing. So auto dealerships are the common example where floor plan financing is used. And for those dealerships where the operating entity leases from a related real estate holding company, the real estate company can still take bonus on the property. So this is a good news as far as finalizing the the bonus regulations that if if there is a landlord who is not related, whose, whose books and financials are separate, who has not taken a floor plan financing uh, opportunity, there is a possibility that they can claim 100% bonus on their holding company when they acquire the property. So in order to be bonus eligible, property generally needs to be acquired and placed in service after September 27, 17, and before January 1, 23. You know, when I say acquired and placed in service, to me, there are two tests, and you need to satisfy, satisfy both tests. There are acquisition rules, and then there are place in service rules. Not every time if, if you put the property place and service between the bonus eligibility window, that means that it qualifies for 100% bonus. No, you have to meet both the acquisition requirements and the place and service requirement. And we're going to go over it in detail. So with buildings that are newly constructed, uh, we, we look at the certificate of occupancy to define when the building shall be placed in service. But for acquired building, we look at the ready and available for intended use standard. So it's possible to acquire a building 
that's not ready and available to use. Maybe the, the interior is unfinished or there may be plans to gut and renovate the interior in order to attract tenants. Once the building is ready and available for use, you can begin recovering the cost of it through depreciation deduction. So when determining the acquisition date of when a property is acquired, there are once again two basic types. There is an acquired existing property, which we call it a used property, and then newly constructed property, which is new property. Like I mentioned before, under TCJA, both of these basic types, they can be eligible for 100% bonus. And prior to TCJA, the number one over here, which is acquired existing property, never existed. So for acquired existing property, the date the taxpayer enters into a written binding contract is key for determining the applicable bonus rate. So the 2019 final regs, they provide that the acquisition date of property that is acquired pursuant to a written binding contract is deemed to have been acquired on the later of the following dates. The date on which the contract is entered, the date on which the contract is enforceable under state law, and if the contract has one or more cancellation periods, if the contract has one or, one or more contingency clauses, the date on which all conditions subject to such clauses are satisfied, is the date that is the date for the written binding contract. Just an FYI, the, these regulations, they also clarify that a letter of intent to purchase property is not a binding contract. So for new property or self-constructed property, uh, we, we, the previous slide was on the used property, but now we're talking about the self-constructed, the new constructed property. The property is considered acquired when the taxpayer begins construction. So that construction date begins when the taxpayer has incurred physical work of a significant nature. And a safe harbor allows the taxpayer to determine the effective acquisition date or the date when physical work of a significant nature has been completed. So the date when 10% of the total hard construction cost has been incurred is considered to be the safe harbor rule. I mean, there was a brief period prior to this when the IRS issued those initial 2018 proposed regs and they were treating those in different two different ways. Uh, whether the taxpayer, the property with a third party with a written binding contract rule, they were doing it themselves and treating taxpayer different when a significant nature from when we have normally understood self-constructed property. So in other words, prior to these final regs, if you had a signed contract with a, with a third party, with a general contractor, the date you signed that contract was the key and considered to be the date you meet the acquisition requirement. But now under the new final regs, that's why we crossed it out. I mean, that rule is gone. Now it all goes back to the safe harbor and the physical work of a significant nature there. So, and there is a safe harbor, which is a 10%, that includes only the hard construction costs, not soft costs like the architectural legal fee and so on. So the next set of slides, we will cover the basis of qualified improvement property and the changes to qualified improvement property through the TCJA, which I which I call it like two cumbersome jargon act. Uh, we will and here's that and accounting method changes. So what is qualified improvement property? It was, it was introduced to us as part of the PATH Act in 2015, if you guys recall, 
the PATH Act came out in 2015, and they initially, they first introduced the Qualified Improvement Property, which got effective, effective in 2016 onward. So as discussed before, several special asset classifications are now removed as part of the TCJA, uh, which are the Qualified Leasehold Improvement, Property, Qualified Retail, Qualified Restaurant, with the intention that qualified improvement property would replace all of them. So qualified improvement property are the improvements made by the taxpayer to the interior of a building after the building was originally placed in service and must be made to commercial non-residential buildings. So keep in mind that qualified improvement category does not apply to residential property. And if you see that uh, the final regs, they, they expanded the de definition and they made improvements made by the taxpayer. So it has to be a new improvement. You cannot acquire a property and if they were QIP by the prior owner and then you start carving out QIP from your purchase price. No, that is not acceptable by the IRS. So it cannot be an elevator or escalator. Uh, when we talk about interior improvements, uh, you know, most of the times taxpayers, they think that, oh, I can just take everything and put it in 15 year property and take 100% bonus. And the answer is no. The definition is over here, which is very, very loud and clear that it, it is only related to the interior of the building. So anytime if you are doing improvements and there are some exterior improvements, those are not eligible for qualified improvement property. So it cannot be an elevator or escalator. And the definitions, they definitely have some similarities to leasehold improvement property, but does not have to be completed pursuant to a lease and can be improvements made to a common building area. So also, they can be improvements made to a building at any point after it has originally been placed in service. There is no three-year-old building restriction. However, it has to be placed in service before, uh, before you take these qualified improvement property. So KBKG Insight is uh, qualified improvement property placed in service between September 27, 17 and January 1, 2018 is eligible for 100% bonus depreciation, even though it has a 39 year life. I mean, we are in 2021. However, you never know when you have certain assets back in between this period that could still be eligible for 100% bonus depreciation. And especially the buildings like uh, uh, I would say restaurants and uh, gasoline stations, car wash buildings. Uh, if they were 15 year category, you can just write off, go back and write off the entire building. So I believe on March 27, 2020, uh, the, the CARES Act came out and this was again to jumpstart the economy. And what happened like part of the CARES Act, the much anticipated retail glitch, uh, they corrected it. So they did a technical correction for a depreciable tax life of qualified improvement property from 39 years to 15 years. And they made the correction retroactive for improvement placed in service on January 1, 2018 and after. So the corrected 15 year recovery period, it applies to taxpayers depreciating their property under GDS rates and make it eligible for 100% through 2022. However, for taxpayers, please keep in mind, using the ADS system, QIP is recovered over a 20 year period and it is not subject to bonus depreciation. So the CARES Act, they also slightly changed the definition of qualified improvement property. Like I mentioned before, by adding it and indicating that improvements must be made by the taxpayer. 
It's unclear if the added language was intended to exclude certain taxpayer from benefiting that did before. Perhaps this language was added to provide clarity that QIP paid for, like I mentioned before, by the previous owner of the building is no longer considered QIP to the new owner. In other words, a taxpayer cannot purchase QIP property, and that's period. Uh, we are often asking, and it's worth clarifying as an example. So if, if let's suppose if a previous owner of a property, they completed improvements to the interior of an office building in 19, those improvements would be considered QIP with a 15 year and 100% property to that owner. Now, if you as a taxpayer acquired that office building in 2020, those improvements, or tax basis associated with those improvements would not be depreciated as QIP anymore. So the property would simply be made up of a personal or rent property to be depreciated over the typical five, seven, 15, 39 year maker's class life. And again, one more important thing, uh, which is a confusion that this qualified improvement property only applies to commercial buildings, not residential buildings. So the TCJA, they also place a limitation on taxpayer uh, ability to expense the business interest. I will not going to elaborate on the interest limitation, but rather focus on its effect for QIP. So taxpayers, they can elect out of this interest limitation, uh, which is under code section 163J, uh, but are they require to use ADS method. Again, although QIP is property internal to a building, it can often be made up of both section 1250 and 445 components. So the section 1250 real property QIP will have a 20 year class life and is not subject to bonus eligible under ADS. So in these cases where this election has been made, a cost segregation study is greatly beneficial because the items that we segregate into person property categories are not required to be recovered over ADS class lives. And they can be depreciated over accelerated recovery periods and are bonus eligible. Another very important distinction to be made is that all these updates to QIP and bonus previously discussed are for federal tax purposes. States, they have different rules and many do not conform to bonus such as California and New York and the several do not conform to the 15 year class life for QIP require a 39 year tax life instead. So California, for example, does not conform to either the 15 year or the QIP and decouples from the bonus rates. In general, these states that decouple are states with higher tax rates. We definitely recommend cost segregation as a useful strategy to offset tax liability. So I will highlight RevProc 2020-25 that came out after uh, CARES Act. It was issued on April 2017, 2020, and it provides guidance on how to implement the QIP corrections made within the CARES Act. So with this guidance, the IRS, they provide several options. Of, of course, number one is they can file an amended return. They can file a superseded return or if they file an accounting method change, which is a form 3115 to correct depreciation. So QIP corrections using form 3115, they have a new method change number, which is DCN number 244. And the new DCN, it provides flexibility to certain taxpayers who would not have been allowed to use DCN number seven for depreciation changes. For example, I mean, DCN number seven, it cannot be used if a historic credit was claimed 
on QIP or cannot be used as a second method change for the same item within a five year period. I mean, there's a five year scoping limitation. But now the taxpayer, they can file a form 3115 with DCN number 244. And they also have a reduced filing requirement in order to reduce administrative burden. And they just have to fill out fewer sections of the form. We also have a KVKG resource library that we have uploaded samples and it's free to go to our website and download those forms. A number of depreciation elections are also addressed in RefRoc 2020-25. And this is because the new 15 year Hello? Hey, Malik, we could hear you, but there, I think you also activated text to speech, but it sounds good now. Oh, it sounds good. So there are a number of uh, uh, a number of depreciation elections that are addressed in 2020-25. As you can see this table on the left side, there is a code section 168G7, 168K7, 168K10, and 168K5. And then on the right hand side, you will see the column that is process for late election, process to revoke. So in other words, you can now, you have an opportunity, there is a limited time, to change or revoke election for ADS, whether to elect out of bonus, electing 50% versus 100% bonus on assets acquired in 2017. So there is only one thing where you cannot file the form 3115, which is code section 168 G7. So the process of taxpayers, they making a late election or revoking uh, you know, are included in 2020-2022. We talked about 2020-25 in our previous slides. I also want to highlight some other rep procs that came out after CARES Act, which are extremely important with respect to bonus depreciation, QIP, uh, and revoke revocation of section 163j so retroct 2020-23 it allows uh, bba partnerships to amend 2018 and 2019 returns as long as amended returns and k1s are filed before september 30 2020. again uh, there are also procedural guidance to apply the 2020 final regs 2020 19 final regs and a combination of 2019 final and proposed regs with the DCN numbers 246 and 247. This was all introduced and started in RETROC 2020-50, which came out recently. Uh, there is my, my firm, they have developed resources and samples regarding the IRS Form 3115 and reduced statement requirements. There are samples over there. And please reach out to me or after this presentation, you can email it to me or go to our website and download it from our KVKG resource library. I, I like examples and here is, a, here is a good example that explains how, how QIP and cost segregation, they work together. So a taxpayer, he acquired the commercial retail building in June of 2019 for $2 million. The building was constructed in 2010. And now the taxpayer, he spends a million dollar last year in 2020 on a renovation improvement. When we did a cost seg, 100,000 for rooftop HVAC units, 50,000 for new windows, 30,000 for seismic upgrades, 
we put it and carve it out into a 39 year structure rear property bucket. 70,000 for interior HVAC, 200,000 for new electrical switches, 100,000 for new bathroom plumbing, 250,000 for drywall patching, all eligible for 15 year QIP and thus 100% bonus eligible. Some five year property, which is for decorative finishes, trade fixtures and millwork. And finally, some site improvements, uh, which are 15 year land improvements for exterior asphalt or curbs or sidewalks. So here is a good example where if a client spent $1 million, that doesn't mean that the entire $1 million will be eligible for QIP and a 15 year life. There might be certain costs that are not eligible so we should be very careful, God forbid, in case of an IRS audit. This is an image, I, I love this image and I, I still have it on my wall as well. Uh, we call our qualified improvement quick reference chart. It's available on our website at kbkg.com slash resources. And this chart has been recently updated to reflect the changes to QIP as per the CARES Act. And it also provides a comprehensive history of the bonus rules. And it also shows, if you see the columns, that whether there is a three-year rule requirement, whether it's an unrelated party rule requirement, whether they are eligible for code section 179, so all of those important things are on this one page. And I will definitely strongly encourage you to look at it as it summarizes most of what we talked about today. So we are going to now talk about the CARES Act, some of the key important changes. And as I mentioned in March of 2020, the CARES Act was passed again to jumpstart the economy and the Senate it was signed into law by the president. Um, the CARES Act, it has many provisions for businesses and individuals, but I'm going to highlight only a few tax-related ones that we have not already discussed. And the major one we already covered is the QIP correction. But the CARES Act, they also created a refundable employee retention credit. And now employers are eligible for a credit based on 50% of qualified wages paid up to 10,000 during the crisis. It would be available to employees whose businesses were disrupted due to virus related shutdowns and firms experiencing a decrease in gross receipts of 50% or more when compared to the same quarter last year. The credit is available for employees retained but not currently working due to the crisis for firms with more than 100 employees and for all employee wages of firms with 100 or fewer employees. Uh, for your information, in 2020, this test, instead of 50% is 20%. So there is definitely a big uh, opportunity over here that was discussed and that was introduced under CARES Act. So prior to CARES Act, the TCJA, um, you know, they, they talked about the net operating losses to lower tax liability. I mean, TCJA, they restricted carrybacks of NOLs uh, generated in taxpayers after December 31, 2017. And they also limited carry forwards to 80% of the taxable income. The CARES Act now allows taxpayers with NOLs that are generated in 2018, 19, and 2020 to be carried back to each of the five preceding tax years. So in this webinar that we are going over today, the whole point is that under the CARES Act, now these NOLs, they can be carried back five years and they can be carried forward. So in other words, you have, a, you have an opportunity to go back and claim a refund uh, of and avail these net operating losses. The provision, this provision also modifies the loss limitation to pass through businesses so they can benefit from the annual carryback rules just described. 
So in other words, if your client is has paid taxes in previous years, now is the chance to go back. And this is the last year. 2020 is the last tax year where you can go back and claim a refund five years back, like I mentioned. So the calculations of NOLs in 2019, 2020 may be greater as a result of this 163J. So the, the changes that also happen as part of CARES Act, that they change the limit from 30% to 50% for business interest expense deduction. And the CARES Act also allows taxpayer to substitute their 2020 ATI with 2019 ATI if it results in a more favorable deduction calculation. They delayed the estimated tax payments and payment of employee payroll taxes. And there are several other provisions that we discussed in, in our article, as you can see the link over here, um, that is also beneficial for not only the real estate people, but to, uh, to any taxpayer. So from tax planning perspective, with regards to QIP bonus and generating great deduction or losses, cost segregation is certainly the best tool, the most common tool available to benefit real estate owners. The primary goal of the cost segregation is to identify all property related to five, seven, or 15 year, but there is a secondary goal right now. And the secondary goal is to establish the depreciable tax value for each major building component. So it complies with the unit of property definitions under the tangible property regs. If you recall, tangible property regs got, got finalized back in 2014 and 15, it has changed um, the cost segregation industry. Before, we used to just uh, carve out five, seven, 15 year, but now there is also like an enhanced study that we do in order to comply with the unit of property definitions and in, intangible property rate. It also helps assets with claim of retirement loss or partial disposition deduction. So in other words, the real property, instead of one line item, we further detail and break out the real property so that there is a future retirement loss or partial disposition as a result of improvements. So the studies, they are performed in uh, year purchase. However, you can always go back and do the study. Uh, you do not have to amend the return. You can just file a form 3115 and claim any missed deductions in year performed. It also, there is a, the rule of thumb is that uh, it's, it's viable, it's building depreciable basis is 750,000. Now with this 100% bonus on used property, sometimes even $600,000 basis is makes sense to do a cost segregation study because you get to write off the entire five, seven and 15 year as a result of cost segregation study that we do. Uh, there is also any time if the basis is less than 500,000, and for residential properties, if the new number of units are less than six, we have developed an online software where you can just do it yourself or we can just do the study with a fractional amount of fee. So keep in mind the cost segregation studies, they can be done on acquired property, new construction property, remodeled property, any build outs, any condos, and all of these categories, they are eligible for 100% bonus depreciation as long as they are within the eligibility window, which is a present requirement, and they meet the acquisition test, which is the acquisition requirements, which for new construction, we talked about that 10% safe harbor. We can go as far as back in 1987 to do a study as long as there is enough depreciable basis and the return of investment makes sense. 
like I said, prior to, I would say, uh, TPR, tangible property regs, uh, the, the right hand side, the you can see the buckets. It was just five, seven, 15, and 39 year. But now we are doing an enhanced study where we will identify the repairs, the demo expense, uh, retirements, uh, bonus rates, uh, qualified improvement property. And you can see for the 39 year category, we will further break it down and, and assign values to roof, windows, doors, lighting. And the whole purpose is that if you will have a value of those assets as the time of acquisition, and two years from now or four years from now, let's suppose you replace a roof, uh, and unfortunately it's not an expense, then based on our study, you can take that number and you can take claim the retirement loss. Please note that uh, everything what we have discussed so far is, is purely for federal tax purposes. And to understand how federal tax reform would change state tax codes, we need to explore the idea of conformity. So for reasons of administrative states, you know, they frequently seek to conform many and, and they sometimes do not conform to 15 year and bonus rates. So please keep that in mind that whatever we bonus depreciation we discuss, it's purely for federal tax purposes. Having said that, there are some states, they do conform to bonus and they do conform to 15 year life. Uh, Section 163J election, it is required ADS and no bonus is available for real property. However, the personal property can be segregated and continue to use DDS rates and bonus eligible. So we are talking about CPAs and taxpayers and how they can generate deductions. Uh, of course, cost segregation study is one of the tools uh, which we, we went over, but commercial buildings that have been improved with energy efficient lighting uh, section 179, 45L tax credits, R&D tax credits, transfer pricing, um, employee retention credits. I mean, these are the things we all do in-house and these are help and these are all the opportunities to generate losses. And like I mentioned, for net operating losses in order to claim a refund, 2020 is the last tax year. I think it's it's important to mention that there are significant differences among cost advisors in the marketplace. And, and I've already mentioned the importance of using the ASCSP certified member. If not, I am also a certified ASCSP professional. And not many, I mean, there are members in that organization, but there are a few certified cost tech professionals. So you really want to engage someone who can think outside the box. Um, we as KBKG, we proud to, to say that we always try to think outside the box and try to maximize the deductions and see if there are any other opportunities that are available. You really need to make sure that you have the best provider who is advising you on these complicated bonus depreciation 163J, 199A, um, 1031 exchange issues. So you really need to make sure that you are engaged with the best provider who can advise you on those topics. Uh, there are other uh, tax related topics such as repairs versus capitalization, uh, energy credits, energy tax incentives for commercial buildings, uh, tax considerations, property tax issues, uh, step up issues, I'm forgetting those as well. There are too many issues whenever you buy a property that could be related to that. And always make sure that you are evaluating a cost segregation provider and choosing the one who will best give you the, the advice and support. Here is my contact information. And if you have any questions, definitely feel free to email it to me.